And uh, this morning, uh, we're going to try to share some tips and tricks, workarounds, that sort of thing. And Anne has graciously woken up very early from where she is and is going to attempt to negotiate the technology to connect to a test server to show us a neat little trick. Yeah, this is something that I found. Um, we're not live with Koha yet. So I've been doing an awful lot of testing and trying things and seeing seeing what works and what doesn't. And one of the things that we'd really wanted to have was a, um, a spell check feature. Um, we do a, an awful lot of um, adding notes for customers, um, copying blurbs, putting them in place, putting in um, contents lists and things like that. And people's fingers get tangled up and you put in typos and all those sorts of problems. We wanted a way to do that. And Koha didn't have an inherent, an, an inbuilt um, spell check feature. And when I was fiddling around, I found that in Firefox, I can use the, um, uh, the language tool functionality to spell check in Koha. And that's what I'm going to hope and try to demonstrate to you guys today. So I'm having to um, switch between outside the server where I'm talking to you now and the video and sound works and inside our server where the demonstration is. So fingers crossed it's all going to work. Just a moment. Right. Share screen. Oh, and I want that one. Right. Do you see it? A nice blue screen? Yes, excellent. Okay, so I'll open up our instance of Koha. I'm on Open Sesame. Oh dear. No, what I'm getting is a dead screen. So I'll just go and um, stop that for a moment. Quickly go and open up the... Um, the right part, just a sec. Uh, sorry, I had this sitting working ready to go and it has um, timed out on me. So I'm just opening it up again. No problem. Right. I think we've all been there with trying to do live demos. I was just about to say, oh, yeah. Yes, not my favorite. We know. Right, okay. So, so fingers crossed, okay. Now let's just go to share screen and do that again. Now we have a sign in screen. Great. Any luck this time? Are you seeing a Koha? Blue screen. Blue screen. Okay. Try again. I would say more of a teal screen. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the steel <laughs> the blue color is <laughs> lovely. I've never seen a TSOD. <laughs> okay, let's try oh, the again. The remote desktop connecting screen is sort of a teal. Yeah. Do we see Koha now? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Right. Okay. Fingers crossed we'll be able to search. Okay, so um, at this point, I had one open. I'll just go and um, okay. So this is just our test database at this stage. Um, so there's not a um, there's all sorts of weird stuff in here, but um, I'll just open up a um, a screen a, a record, and I'm just going to put in some. Um, some random um, words in there that are poorly spelt um, and see how we go. Right. Uh, okay. Right. So at this point, what I can do is select all of the chunk that I wish to spell check. Now I could do the whole record, but I'm probably not going to want to. Um, you know, I'm fairly confident that all the stuff up the top is 
um, is, is right. It's these notes fields that I particularly want to have a look at. So if I just do that, highlight it, select it, other click, and click on the um, check spelling and grammar because I have my, um, my language tools enabled at this point. It opens up a nice little box here and it gives me underline, red underlines of the things that it thinks are misspelled. Now, of course, at this point, it's also including the, um, the, field, the subfield delimiters and codes, which is really irritating. Um, <laughs> but um, you can look past that and you can see, oh my goodness, there's a definitely a word in there that doesn't seem to make sense. It's giving me spelling options. I can fix it or I can just straightforward overtype it or just renew it, uh, remove it altogether. Um, and so I could say confident at that point. Um, and I'm just going to take that out. Okay, it's also going to give me um, uh, grammar help if I want to have a look and say, oh, that doesn't read so well, do I want to change this, etc, etc. So once I'm happy with it, I can just control A, select the whole lot, control C, flip back to my um, POHA record. Ah, go away. Ah, which is here. And just, it's already highlighted. I don't need to do anything more. Just control V and it puts the corrected text back into my Koha record. And then I can just save it and continue on from there. So um, I just thought that was a really cool thing. And I want to, and, and I shared it with lots of the Koha <laughs> Catalyst people who are doing our development. And they said, yeah, that's a really cool thing too. Um, I'm sure that the user group would be really interested. So I emailed Heather and she said, please demo. So there you go, you've seen it. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you, Anne. I'm, I'm looking forward to trying this. Yeah, in Firefox, all you've got to do is um, add the language tools extension um, and, it, and it works fine. Um, I haven't tested it with anything else because we have settled on Firefox as our company browser. And so I'm only really interested in what extensions work with Koha from Firefox. Hmm. But I, I would anticipate that other, um, other systems have the same um, functionality here. Hmm. Yeah, I found that I use Firefox. I have it set to my advanced cataloging editor. And then I use Chrome set with the basic bibliographic editor because each one has its pros and cons. And also some, some of my volunteers do some of their record editing in the basic editor. So I wanna see what they're seeing, mm -hmm. but I'm interested in uh, seeing if Chrome has any sort of features like that as well. Mm, yeah. Um, we are only using the advanced editor. So our team don't even see the basic. <laughs> mm. Well, thank you so much, Anne. Well, I hope it hope it was interesting and useful for people. Definitely. Um, and I was wondering, uh, you may have told us before, but I've forgotten. Are you going to go live on 1911 or 20 point five? Oh, um, it's 20 point. I, I, I'm not I'm. I think I'm not sure. Um, we've been testing in 19, but we've had so much customization done that um, I think that we're going to hold where we are and, um, and go live on that. Um, you probably saw some things in the advanced editor that I was demonstrating. You're thinking, mine doesn't do that. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the, the, the really obvious one is there's a really big red bold cataloged um, statement to when the, the work has been completed. Um, and that's for us because we're a cataloging vendor and so we supply bibliographic records to dozens of clients and I have um, you know, 12 other catalogers and I don't want people wasting their time fiddling with a record which has been finished. <laughs> hmm. 
We're on 1911 as well. Um, we're supported by Bywater, who is, and they're looking at doing most of the upgrades to 20.5 in January. And I am so looking forward to having persistent macros in the advanced cataloging editor. Right. Hmm. Um, yeah, we, we've had a little look at um, the macros in, um, in, <laughs> in the, the ones that are inherent in, um, in Koha, but we have a third party macro tool that we use really extensively and we're going to continue using that. Um, it's really flexible, so we can do an awful lot with it. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, okay, I think my bit's over. Someone yes. else's turn. <laughs> does anyone else have anything uh, that either workarounds or tips and tricks or things they'd like to share or questions, things that are kludgy that they're seeking to improve? Well, I've always got some naive questions. Ask away, because... I. I I've found that someone else always has the same question. It's just not fully formulated yet. <laughs> uh, I've been hammering at my authorities, uh, which are a disaster for his uh, Z3950 brings in just a dog's breakfast of options. Uh, the question today is, where are the lines drawn between a fictional character, a legendary character, and a mythological character? Or is this just a matter of random choice by uh, Library of Congress catalogers? Well, no, it's a, it's a very good question. And one that's being asked more and more because RDA, with the implementation of RDA, things have changed. Yeah. The Library of Congress used to have all of these sorts of names. Uh, let's see, have I had enough coffee? Um, I believe they were in the subject authority system and they're now moving to the name authority system. That's that correct, sense. yes. Yes, okay, all right. Yay for my coffee. Um, the, uh, the informal way of thinking about it is sort of feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, if there's literary warrant, meaning which is always the Library of Congress way of doing things. The headings are created through literary warrant. There has to be, you know, literary. There have to be published instances covering this figure in order to create the heading. And if in this literary warrant or published warrant, there have there is evidence, overwhelming evidence that actual feet were on the actual ground, then they would tend to not get a qualifier of you know, mythological figure, literary Northeast figure. Kansas Hi, George. Northeast <laughs> Kansas Library. <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, then they just have a name heading. But if, uh, if there's not that overwhelming evidence, then they might get that qualifier. Or if they're going to be confused with another person like spirits. Right. The, the problems I'm having is, uh, you know, characters like uh, uh, Robin Hood or Merlin or uh, uh, Greek heroes we're not really sure existed. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Native American figures that I'm not sure which of these applies since uh, it was uh, strictly oral tradition for, for centuries. And right. we've got a few characters that show up with more than one definition. Right. So, so my understanding is that if it's, um, if it's someone that's being written about um, has been created now in current fiction, their fictitious character, so um, let me think. Um, uh, um, oh, whoever the lead, the latest lead child, um, <laughs> Jack Reacher. Okay, Jack Reacher is a fictitious character. 
Um, he's been written up. He was. He's. He's a character that has been created in modern fiction. If they are, if they come from an oral tradition, then you have a choice between um, mythological or legendary. Um, and the Library of Congress, as far as I know, hasn't given a clear um, guideline on which they use. I could have a look and see if I can find that, but. Um, my understanding is that it's mythological if it's religious and it's legendary if it's not. <laughs> so <laughs> um, there's also things like deities in there as well. So you get, you know, some, right. some right. Greek deity and, and things like that. But that's the that's the definition that I've sort of come up with as a rule of thumb. Mm. Okay, so it looks like I need to go take all of my North... Uh, mythology and move it into Norse uh, uh, legend then. Well, <laughs> so um, most of them should have a qualifier by now. They um, do, but it's inconsistent. Yeah, well, that may be historical. Um, you know, yes. they, they were defined one way and now they're being defined another way. Um, just have a quick look at the Library of Congress. I'm trying say. to search for Thor since Thor yeah. is uh, in sacred narratives, but also in comic books. Right. And it may be he gets two entries as a result of that. No, no. If they're, um, if they're established as a legendary or mythological figure, they retain that even if they're being yeah. written about in modern fiction or modern graphic novels or reinvented or whatever. It's the same subject heading regardless of the treatment. That makes um, sense. Including really what looks like really weird things like, um, oh, the various incarnations of Sherlock Holmes, you know, yeah. where, <laughs> you know, started off as someone... <laughs> written by Conan Doyle, but now it's been written by lots of other characters, including some female ones. And um, it, it's still, the subject heading is still Sherlock Holmes' fictitious character. They don't right. they don't make any distinction between the different flavors of Sherlock Holmes. Hmm. Okay. Well, the religious aspect for mythology helps a lot. That will let me sort that out. I will actually go away and do a little bit of research and make sure that I'm not telling lies. But <laughs> no, no, don't confuse me with more information. That's not good. <laughs> I did find two different headings for Thor. I'll put them in the chat. I found Thor, fictitious character from Marvel Comics Group, and Thor, Norse deity. Right. Okay. So what that should mean, I think, is that um, the Thor fictitious character is a superhero rather than the with that name, rather than the legendary character who's been written about? Right. Fingers crossed. That's what it should mean. I think so. And both of them were in the name authority file versus subject, so those have moved over. I think another thing I, I try to keep in mind is that. Uh, someone would have had to come across something in order to try to make these things consistent. And yes, we do discover inconsistencies. And the Library of Congress is always open to hearing the comments and suggestions and questions. So it usually is worthwhile if an inconsistency is discovered to write in and say, is this inconsistent or is it consistent and I just don't understand why? Do you have an email address? Oh, yeah. Yes, that's uh, <laughs> There's dozens of them, <laughs> a big outfit like that. It's, uh, writing to the wrong office just annoys people. Right. Yeah, here we go. I'll put a link in the chat. And they do, they have a catalog or authority record error report form that is linked right there. That's good. I always like being part of a larger solution.
So does uh, anybody else have any questions? Not <clears throat> really a question, but uh, I found something that uh, probably everyone else knows about in uh, deduplicating fields. Uh, there's a function in MarkEdit that will do that very nicely. Uh, so I was updating some, this is from the author's catalog, I was updating um, preliminary records with indexed records. That just cut down my work by uh, several hours per batch. I'm, I've been in and out of this meeting because we're doing job interviews for a replacement boss and, and I just answered a phone call, but I know you're talking about authority control. Um, so um, I don't know if this has already been talked about, but is anybody using an outside vendor for authority control? We're not, but I know that people in the cataloging SIG have and do. This is cataloging, right? Mm hmm Okay. But it isn't everything touching cataloging. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> well, I was just curious, uh, and it does, I'm guessing in since nobody piped up, I'm guessing nobody here does, so. George, uh, we used Markive to do a, a, an authority project because we hadn't um, updated and maintained authorities for years and years. And so we did that to sort of get up to date, but our budget doesn't really allow. For the ongoing maintenance. All the time, so we're kind of thinking we did it last year and we'll wait a couple years and then maybe we'll do another one. Not ideal perhaps, but um, this is what we could afford. And and the process was good. I, I thought Markive did a good job and they were easy to work with. Thanks, Barb. Sure. At my last job, there had been an authority cleanup with a vendor. And again, the budget wasn't there to, to continue it as an ongoing process. But at the last job, we were able to keep up with it. Um, right now, I'm working on a big project to clean up our authorities in-house. And it's slow, but uh, affordable. <laughs> I think this is where I confess that I haven't really done much of anything with authority files. And maybe you'll inspire me to get started. You can make a lot of progress a half hour a day. Half hour a day, okay. Where do I get that? <laughs> That's a trouble with uh, multitasking. Yeah, sometimes I'll just try to work on it heading by heading. Yeah, we've never had um, authority control or even a cleanup. We tried to get some money for a cleanup project a few years ago, but it hasn't happened. So our database is a, is a mess. But so we kind of do the same thing, like you said, like a heading that I know is used heavily, like cooking to cookery or something like that. I'll just be like, you know what, I'm just going to run a report of that heading. I'm going to clean it up in the database because it's used here. You know, you just kind of go by what you know your patrons are looking for, you know, and, you know, we're, we're small, a small public library, not academics. So, um, but still, uh, you know, it's, it's horrible <laughs> not having, you know, clean subject headings, but, uh, you know, you do what you can. I'm the only cataloger, but I have like m multiple other jobs, you know, trying to train somebody to help out with that. So that's what we do it like kind of on a gosh, we didn't have, you know, World War, you know, World War comma 1939 pointing to World War Two, which is what everybody searches for. So that was like the first thing we put in, you know, you just you do what you can do. I'd love to have an authority control project. <laughs>
it's a, a, always a question of, you know, how are the, the researchers in my library going to approach the question? And uh, that leads me to some non-standard approaches. Um, we have an awful lot of international material. And so uh, I've had to insert United States ahead of the state entries from Library of Congress because that really annoys people from other countries. Well, and really it's how, like you said, it's how are your users most often trying to find things? Uh, we're doing a lot by trying to put in, this one uh, thing I have a volunteer working on, putting in more summary notes or just general 500 notes about, you know, to just talk more about the content, that sort of thing, because then that gets at least things into the keywording. And sometimes we'll use that approach for when we have a voyage narrative and we cannot nail down what ship this really was because the ship is named something, you know, like uh, the Mary. It's like there are so many ships named Mary that we've tried and tried and tried and we can't figure out which, which one. At least we can put in a 520 that says, you know, account of their voyage on the vessel Mary from New York to San Francisco. Mark Edit has a really nice authority checking tool too that pings the Library of Congress ID's website. It doesn't, I think it will swap some of the headings for you and insert URIs, but like some of them it at least kind of points out what's wrong in your catalog. Yeah, I've been wanting to use Mark Edit a little bit more for that. Uh, Fred has done some really good Mark Edit presentations and the recordings are very useful. And also uh, Terry Reese has some really useful Mark Edit videos. Let's see, I think I might have a link to his channel that I can put in the chat, link to these. Yes, he's been doing a whole uh, series of shelter in place videos. Yeah. And he's much more of an authority on Mark Edit than I am. Pay attention to him first. On the other hand, I have the viewpoint of someone who is learning it and probably knows some of the problems that are so obvious to him that he doesn't think of them anymore. My problem is just getting it to install. What do you have? Uh, what system? I mean, Windows, uh, Mac? Linux. Hmm? Linux. I've installed yeah. it on Linux. I just don't remember how I did it. <laughs> yeah, I know that's very helpful. Have, have you thought of uh, posting Bruce to the Mark Edit discussion list to uh, get some help with that? That's probably the next step I need to take. Now that I know it exists. Yes. Oh, it's a great resource. And oftentimes Terry Reese will answer the question himself. I think that man never sleeps. Usually within about three or four minutes. Yeah. Let's see if we can put sleep. some info in the chat about the Mark Edit list. I asked him about that once. He was noncommittal. <laughs> Well, when you work from home, a lot of options are there. Going back to Koha, we've been doing a lot of work um, on the templates for importing records. Um, is that something that you guys use a lot? Extensively. Mm -hmm. I've customized uh, several different uh, frameworks uh, for books and serials and other things. It, uh, it really simplifies matters. Uh, you pull it on a Z3950 record and you just ignore all the stuff that doesn't apply. Right, now I'm not talking about the, the, um, 
the bib, the, the bib frame, I'm talking about the mark modification templates that changes the mark as you import it. Ah, sorry. Yeah. No? I've played. I, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still a newbie playing with it and then going, hmm. Right. We've used them um, for digital records. So we're bringing in a file of digital records and, you know, putting in some of the 952 item fields, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. We're not really changing the mark records so much, but right. um, they're very handy. Hmm. Have you all been getting them going? Apparently, I don't know what they are. <laughs> uh, neither do I. I just heard about them. Could you uh, say a little bit more about them and what they do? Uh, well, I could share my screen again. Let me go and um, yes, please do a, do a quick um, refresh and make sure that I've still got it operational. Um, F2. Saving. So, just a sec. Um, let's find the share screen. Real server. Right. So, if we go back to home and into tools and we flip down here, there are these things called mark modification templates. And what it does is as you import a batch of records, it automatically applies the changes that you have chosen to apply to that batch of records. And you can see we've got a, a range of, of different options in there. So if I have a look at, um, oh, what we want to do with OCLC print. So if I'm importing a batch of records from OCLC, these are the changes that I want to have applied to the whole batch. Um, open it up. And I've got a whole bunch of fields that I want to delete because they're of no use whatsoever to us or any of our customers. Um, I've got a, an exciting piece of work which um, takes the ISBN qualifier out of the A subfield and puts it into a Q subfield, which is one of the things that um, some of our customers want us to do because their own library management system will only map on numbers and it's enormously confused if you have a qualifier saying paperback in your A subfield. And I would much rather a machine did that than I had to have catalogers doing it. Um, let me see. Um, it's, the next one is um, deleting the ebook ISBN from print records. We don't ever want that um, in there. Um, some stuff about um, updating PBK to paperback. Once again, we've got customers who are fussy about that. Um, some more delete fields. I'm um, deleting all the fast headings. None of our customers want fast um, subject headings. And once again, that's something that we, I would much rather have a machine delete for us than have individual catalogers having to do. Um, let me see. Uh, oh, uh, there's something about, there's one there about, um, when the second indicator matches one, um, once again, that's um, children's subject headings. We don't want them in our um, in, in the records we're supplying. Um, we're getting rid of BISAC and GMD and SEERS subject headings. Um, something about updating um, or fixing a, a, a frequently um, mistaken subdivision in there. Um, let me see. Oh, that's the uh, that's B sub build stuff. So those are the sorts of things that that we uh, you know I've been through this with our you know looked through an OCLC record and decided what are all the fields I want to get rid of and what are all the um, the automatic changes that I want to make to a record and it's different of course for print and DVD but you know those are the sorts of things that that we're looking at those mark modification templates for. Okay. Does that make sense? Hmm. It does. Yeah. yeah. I've been using um, Mark Edit to delete you know, fast and GND, but this looks faster. 
Well, it's yeah, a, that it's, looks it's fantastic. One, it's a one-step process rather than a, um, you know, rather than a multi-step process, and that's what we try and do is try and find just the the, the quickest way to to achieve the result. Yeah, you could do it in Mark Edith, and we certainly have in the past. But that's one of the things that we wanted to do is coming to Kohar is not have to massage the records in Mark Edith before we import it. Hmm. Got to confess, I uh, massage the records in Notepad. <laughs> On the other hand, I uh, add maybe a hundred books a year to our catalogs. So. I was I was going to say, you know, our batch load process would be like something about five thousand a day. <laughs> we'll operate on a slightly bigger scale. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to do five a day. Well, you know, Anne, I think you've got the genesis of a really interesting Kohokan presentation about how you use the templates and setting them up in the design. Okay, yeah. <laughs> There's, a, there's a, a couple of things that we've had um, catalysts develop for us within that, but um, most of it is standard out of the box koha. Well, it's either you talk or I recite another poem. <laughs> well, you get most of our records from C39.50. Can I do a mark modification template for those? Does it work the same way? Um, not right now. Um, <laughs> we, that is something, that's a piece of work that we've had done for us to apply our mark modification templates to Z3950 imports. Um, it's exactly the same template and it was a relatively quick piece of work for um, the development team to do, but it's not in general release yet. Um, and it would certainly pay to um, put it in on the bug, Zilla, um, because it, since it's been done for one customer, it's quite likely to be relatively easy to do for others. We had talked to Bywater about doing a development for that kind of thing, because we pretty much use Z39 all for all our records. And we don't want certain fields to come in because we just have to delete them out. Yeah. Um, and they gave us, um, you know, a cost for the development, but it sounds like maybe y'all are already partway into that. So that would be good. I think I found a, a very, very bare bones bug that mentions it, but it's a very old bug. It's definitely one of the things that saves catalogers a huge amount of time, not having to delete non-wanted field, known non-wanted fields. I mean, there's always the odd thing that, you know, you, have, you look at the record and you think, what on earth? But all the standard ones like fast headings or, um, Oh, um, let's see, French subject headings or German subject headings or BISAC headings or all the things that you know your customers aren't going to want. Hmm. Need to go find that bug and bump it. Well, we've done sort of small things to help our catalogers out, which is really just me and one other person. Um, so we've, you know, applied color to certain buttons on the screen that we use the most just to draw our eye quickly. So like we've got the macros button red and we've got the save record button, I guess, green, just, you know, just to it's just easy to see, you know. And then on the um, item record, we have the fields that we use the most. Um, I think we turned those red because we want to make sure we're always seeing those. And then 
I don't know if it was this last um, Koha US conference, but Jason Robb from Seckles, he always has such great stuff. And he had some code that would allow you to rearrange item fields in, you know, in an order that works for you best. And so we did that. I don't, I'm not a real share your screen person, but let me see if I can do it here. <laughs> That would be great. It would be lovely to see. Are, um, are you making these changes through jQuery? It was jQuery and maybe even um, something else. Let me poke around here. As you can see, I'm not real adept at sharing my screen. <laughs> it's no problem. Catalogers are very patient people. You'll put up with me having my screen frozen, so. <laughs> and then late at night, we like to go out into a vacant lot and build a fire and roast a chicken on a clothes hanger and talk about going to Mexico with someone named Rita. Don't we all? <laughs> no, they can't do that in Florida. It's too cold, according to Bruce. <laughs> yeah, not, not this week. <laughs> I don't even know if we could light a fire in this weather. There we are. Is it there? Yes. Yep, it is. <laughs> Finally. Yeah, it's great. So um, I would have to look back and find Jason's code, but I, I think it used more than just jQuery, although it is in the, the internet user JS section. But we felt like we were scrolling through the screen and there was a lot of stuff there that we didn't care about. And so we wanted to group it um, that made sense to us. And so we put the fields that we use the most up top here. And, um, and he even had, um, you know, headings for your sections, which was great. Um, and so we just put like things together. And so we've totally brought these, you know, withdraw, loss, status, damage, which generally are at the top. You know, we put those down at the bottom because for cataloging, that's not as important to us. And so we can go in here and fill in our fields and generally our prices and all of this is generally already filled in. And so we've got a few things we need to do here and then I also duplicated the action buttons from the bottom of the screen to the top. So sometimes we can come in, do a few things and just add the item and we're done. And so that has, that just made a huge difference to us, um, what he created and, and we modified what he did for us. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, we really like it. It's fantastic. And I love how the you've got the field colors with the red and the black for a clue. It just draws our eye, you know, to make sure um, that we see it. And, and it's more important, you know, those are the more important fields for most of our records. So, and then, um, Here's the green save to catalog and the red macros. And then we also made our ISBN field green. Just little things. It looks great. <laughs> I can add, um... I'm here. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, loving this. So one of the other things that we did on the item add screen with some more jQuery magic is to pre-fill in some of the fields based on 
other fields you selected. So if you um, select certain uh, shelving locations, then it picks the collection code for you so that I would um, kill for that. people, <laughs> it's a bit, uh, the code is bulky, but I can share it. Um, <laughs> but um, I can show you how that works on my test server if you want to see it. Yes, please. I was just going to ask about that when she was showing her it feels because I mean, if I'm doing, you know, you know, a whole 150 kids books all at once, and they're all going into picture book, and they all have the same collection code, having to put it in every time is just aggravating. Okay, I think I stole the screen share. Can you see my, <laughs> my yes. test server yes. here? Um, okay, so the way I have it set up is if you pick like adult biography, then it fills in adult book. Um, and then if I pick adult magazine, it pops in the serial enumeration um, so that they're only able to use that unless they're crappy uh, <laughs> to when they're doing magazines and that kind of stuff. Um, and the way I have it set up in the code is I've uh, taken it and created like variables for each of the different collection codes and then said these are all of my shelf location codes that belong in that collection code. So you wouldn't be able to just copy the code. You would have to go in there and insert your own shelf locations in the groupings. Um, and then down here, you would uh, have to put in your collection code codes. Um, I think I did I do a write up on this, Barbara? Or did, <laughs> there might be a presentation out there somewhere that I can share. Yeah, because I feel like if you play around with jQuery and you don't know what you're doing, you can really cause a lot of problems. And I really am <laughs> <I'm> not familiar <laughs> with it. <laughs> yeah, you definitely want to play around with it on a test server and get it um, lined up before you start pushing it out to your, your regular thing. J uh, Jason, I think you linked to, um, you've got it on a site that you have, that you've collected, all, yes, a lot of resources. Yeah, okay, so I'll put this link in the chat and you can take a look at it. You can find the chat. So that kind of talks through, it's got the code you can copy and then it kind of talks through each part of it. Um, so you can play around with it. And it took probably, um, I don't know, a couple of days or so, you know, on and off to kind of test things and tweak it. And then maybe I would lose the field completely, you know, and wonder what, what happened. I don't have that in there now. And, and we have a test server, so that worked, but you could probably go over to the the Bywater demo and try some things out and see what you get. Thank you, Jason, because it's made a huge difference for us. I'm glad. Um, the other thing I wanted to share, and I'll just, I guess I could have shared my screen, but we don't use the advanced editor, so we're just using the basic editor, but there may be a way that you can add spell check to the advanced editor uses code mirror. So you might be able to have the developers someday add spell check to that. But for the basic editor, we just use this chunk of code. Um, and, and basically all it does is it adds the spell check attribute to all of those input fields on the basic editor. Uh, and then we get the red squigglies in, in the, those fields. But I was poking at it during this meeting and I couldn't get it to work with jQuery on, on the advanced editor. So. Um, it does look like there are projects out there that add spell check to code mirror. So it, it might be possible as a development. Yeah, I searched around a little bit in Bugzilla and I didn't find anything for spell check. So that might be something to add to Bugzilla or yeah. And this is how newbies with uh, almost no catalog experience do it. Programmable keypad. So I was adding, uh, got a new special collection. I was adding maybe a hundred books, yeah, years worth. Uh, I just set up a macros, uh, 
putting in the date and the clips, and then filled in everything except the barcode. And I just scan it, and that was it. Not an elegant solution, but I don't really care about elegant. No, you, you got it set up and it's working for you. That's pretty elegant. We do have a few more minutes. Any other questions, comments? Well, I have to say, this has been a fantastically useful gathering. I, I can't thank you all enough for the sharing and the questions and what you've brought to the meeting today. I mean, my head's practically exploded with the possibilities. Yes, now I just have to find about a month to sit down and learn all this stuff. Right. There will be a test at the January SIG meeting, Fred, so. You've got a month. <laughs> yeah, our version of the pub quiz. I think I'm going to be busy that day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'll go ahead and stop the recording. But as usual, uh,